So good evening, everyone. Um, my name is Simon. I'm uh, the manager at Talbot House. I'm uh, one of the storytellers as well. And basically, I've been going there, as a number of you know, uh, most of my life. Uh, and um, during this lockdown period, we well, Talbot House doesn't close easily. When they tried to close Tubby in 1918, it took them uh, two months, I think, with orders coming even from the top brass telling him to close down and his sole response was shut up <laughs> can you <he> believe <laughs> in general to shut up he did uh, several times actually so uh, in the end they dragged him out and he continued and we try and continue today we do lots of videos and uh, presentations as well this is the first one we'll try and get more now this is quite important for tonight because we have a, an esteemed public watching uh, amongst them some really good researchers some excellent guides some historians. Um, now, uh, my my role here tonight basically is the presenter. An awful lot of the research uh, I'm about to share with you has been done many, many years ago. It's still being done uh, by our chief archivist, my father. <laughs> so uh, I do have a direct line into those archives, but um, uh, a lot of the work has been done by him in the, the past. So uh, you can really, well, uh, I'm, uh, don't thank me, I would say. Uh, so uh, an awful lot of it was published in his first book, but sadly for all of you that was in Flemish. And uh, we try and buy copies these days of that book, but they go £100 on eBay. <laughs> so it's sold out. But the second book is still available in English, uh, his latest production. Um, so uh, we actually had someone, this is a nice detail, on the crowdfund who's buying up the full supply. So yeah. she's buying 100 copies to send to 100 friends to ask for 100 donations for Talbot House. Yeah. So that's a nice way of <laughs> yeah. thing. Brilliant. Have to reprint it. Now, um, I'm going to share with you the PowerPoint I've made on the tonight's uh, topic. I'll just try and talk you through it. Now, if you do have any questions, I would say, uh, feel free to um, uh, put a microphone on and ask them. If I can't answer them, there's a few people I see on the list here who have been very good to assist me, like Mark Banning or others, um, who, who can always jump in uh, and, and correct me or add on. Uh, because, uh, as I said, uh, I'm by far not the, the, the esteemed researcher who's done all this. I've tried to read my, do my homework, but it was researched by mainly someone else. Um, so here we go okay it's probably too hot up there so we have an awful lot of quotes tonight as well i'd like to start by reading you one of them this is by um the late Major Gordon Carey of the 7th Rifle Brigade. In the early days of August 15, I lay in hospital in Versailles, waiting for news, yet dreading it, and it hurt still to recall how, on the day when a certain casualty list was published, my heart sank as I read through the roll of names. Amongst them were several of my dearest friends. But when I learned that Gilbert Talbot had met with death at a spot where I had stood only a few hours before he fell, I knew immediately that my personal loss was merged in something greater. It was dimly conscious of England's loss, but the greatness of the thing that was to be born out of Gilbert's sacrifice, I could not have guessed. Now, Gilbert was, uh, well, now before I'll tell you about Gilbert, this is briefly the run through of tonight. Uh, I will start with an introduction um, that, well, that brings me to this story. Now, how did I get involved with Gilbert Talbot? Uh, I've been, well, first of all, I live round the corner from where he's buried. Uh, I grew up in Zellebeke for the people who know the area. So that's on one side. And I now live in Zonnebeke, the other side of the cemetery. So it is uh, around the corner, literally from us. So I rent there very often as a, as a teenager to go and have a look around. Now, uh, in... When I turned 17, the last post association organized this kind of um, lecture competition. Um, and the title was show that they did not die in vain. 
I thought as a 17 year old, it was quite hard to prove because, well, as you know, a few years after Gilbert died, we had World War II, etc. So that they did not die in vain. Okay. Uh, so when knowing the story of Gilbert, knowing Talbot House, I did my essay on him, uh, show you a very silly photograph of uh, the 17 year old Simon now. Uh, yes, thank you. <laughs> Say that. Uh, I won the competition, luckily enough, but well, it's fair to say my father is also the English teacher who corrected it. <laughs> uh, and um, the, the story goes on. Um, a few years ago, we had the centenary of the death of Gilbert, and I realized nothing was really being planned. So we put together a walk, which I'm basing tonight on Off uh, around the area, and also a small ceremony. So some of you might recognize the Tokage slam there and Martin, who's um, one of the board members of Tokage Belgium. So we did a Tokage um, light, well, lighting the lamp ceremony um, at the grave of Gilbert, actually on the anniversary of his death. And something interesting for the, the guides here, uh, if you ask the commission to come and assist, uh, you, they send someone in a suit uh, with the almost you know, a brand new spade, <laughs> and his uh, polished shoes to come and plant a rose this is the Talbot House Rose. Fantastic. Now, those of you who have visited us the last five years might have seen them in the garden. It's a spe special breed. Uh, we sell at Talbot House in support of the club. And we had special permission uh, to plant one at his grave. Uh, it's enormous these days and still doing well. So they're very good roses. I can add. I have them in my garden as well. Um, so that's, you know, how the story got a bit personal with me. There you can see. So it was a nice ceremony and we hope to do that every year from now on so that's something we'll uh, we'll do 30th of june uh, july this year 30th of july now gilbert himself was born on the 1st of september 1891 in leeds so his father was the the vicar of the the leeds parish you can see leeds here at the day um now his father was going to have a huge career in um in the church of england taking one from one bishop's seat to the next now, his mother was uh, Lavinia uh, Lakelton, the daughter of the fourth Baron Lakelton. So uh, they, let's say, were, were not lower class, to, <laughs> to put it mildly. But uh, they had a lot of good connections and that really, well, Gilbert's upbringing, um, well, has an awful lot of influences on him in later life. So he's very fond, apparently, of music, uh, poetry as well. He recites from the top of a chair uh, Tennyson and Wordsworth, apparently, uh, for some of the the important people visiting uh, the bishop. And he, as the son of the bishop, obviously spends an awful lot of time in various cathedrals uh, throughout the country. You can see several of them here. Apparently his favorite spot would have been the Rood Loft. I think that's how he called it in English. Um, so uh, spends an awful lot of time there at the cathedral of... Um, uh, Southwark, for instance, um, there's a few others as well. He, um, uh, they go around, there you see. And eventually they end up at Winchester, uh, Winchester Cathedral. So, um, there are an awful lot of connections with Winchester as well and Talbot House at that mm -hmm. time. Um, now, this photo you see here is Winchester College. Uh, where uh, the family went to school, where Gilbert went to school as well. I think, I, from what I gather, the family still goes to school there today, which is good to know. Um, and uh, he actually does quite well. Uh, he has a, a very good tongue, they say. He's a, an excellent speecher. And that still runs in the family, from what I hear. Uh, more on that perhaps later. Now, after his education here, so this is still Winchester College, uh, he goes on to study at Oxford. Now, the one man he really looks up to is his older brother, uh, Neville. Neville, you see here on his wedding day, uh, fought in the South African War. And apparently, uh, he, he remembers that uh, he could withstand a cross-examination on all the battles, small or big, and then the generals and heroes on the Natal side of the fighting. So apparently, he, he was very keen on his history and uh, uh, tried to figure everything out his brother was up to in South Africa. Neville Talbot would eventually uh, end up as, I think, uh, Bishop of Pretoria in later life. So there's a uh, strong South African link there. Christ Church in Oxford. 
So, um, as a well, besides school, he has an awful lot of hobbies. Let's say he's very uh, big with the Oxford Union. So he first joins all the traditional debates, but uh, not before long he ends up, I think, as the president of the organization. And he gets to know a lot of an awful lot of politicians there. Uh, including, uh, at the time, the very unpopular, apparently, David Lloyd George. And during a huge rowdy debate, he manages to control the entire room and, uh, and tells him to listen uh, to David Lloyd George, so, uh, which the, the elder one obviously appreciates enormously. He also enjoys uh, hugely the theatrical life. Uh, his politics bring him to London as well. And one of the people he's really keen on is the former Prime Minister, Arthur Balfour, who is often a guest at uh, the private residence at home. But, um, uh, you know, uh, before the First World War, he obviously was Prime Minister, but he also became Minister for uh, the Navy uh, and External Affairs as well, the Foreign Minister. So, just check, there's a few people in the waiting room I see. Here we go. Thank you for joining us as well. Okay, let's proceed. So he was a very, well, he was a very keen supporter of the Tories and he's actually a founding member of the Young Conservatives. So uh, still running today, I, uh, I I found him on Twitter, still exists today, the Young Conservatives. So again, uh, a link there. Now, um, he also is allowed to write an article on the Times. Uh, the article subject is one of his close friends, Edward, Prince of Wales. So you can see the man is quite well connected. Uh, and that connection with the Prince of Wales, Talbot House and Tockage is going to endure for many, many years. I've got a, a quote here from one of his uh, roommates or housemates, let's say. Everyone talks of his energy and his zest for life. The writer Herbert, who lived in the same digs in Oxford, pictured him. Thundering down in the morning, clamoring for the morning paper, devouring it over his coffee, the latest ministerial, ministerial speech. At the piano, Pia patiently picking out some of the music he loved, but could not make up. Surrounded by many books and heaps of untidiness, arguing far into the night with a few familiar disputants. I see him in the hundred smoky college rooms, the meeting places of the many clubs which prized his speaking. Always he seemed to dominate the scene. Others might make a point, bark out a few disjoint uh, restores, or exhaust the side issue. But none could so aptly draw together the threads of the discussion and give them a constructive and comprehensive uh, treatment. He was curiously lazy about getting up, of uh, getting up in the morning. Uh, yeah, we told him he might be prime minister, but he would never make chancellor of the exchequer. <laughs> <laughs> so lots of connections there. So um, he had high hopes for his political career, and I'm sure he would have gone far. In that as well. So some of the local people, I, well, the people I mentioned, you can see here, Prince of Wales on one side and Lord Balfour on the other side. Now a lot of time is spent at the family uh, residence, uh, the bishop's seat, uh, Farnham Castle, uh, not far from Winchester. So uh, it's one of the places he spends a lot of time in. Um, and it reminds him, it's quite a very, it's a very peaceful surrounding. And he often writes about the castle uh, when he's in Belgium. Now the area he fought quite a lot in, uh, around Hoge, was home to an awful lot of castles as well, at least before the war. Uh, so there's a link there as well with those, all those chateaus. Now, when... Uh, after graduation, uh, Gilbert left on a world trip and apparently on the 31st of July, 1914, he was in uh, oh. Quebec, you see the photograph here, crossing the Atlantic, wars declared. They spent six hours in Quebec, he and his friend, uh, Jeffrey Colburn, and they took the first boat, boat home. The, they've already decided on the spot to do their patriotic duty enlist. Now, soon afterwards, they joined the Rifle Brigade 
Uh, again, the Rifle Brigade, there's quite a few connections there. One is obviously they're very local to Winchester. Uh, secondly, there's the family connection. So on the photograph, you see an, another quite esteemed relative, uh, General Sir Neville Lattleton, um, who was also from the Rifle Brigade. So uh, Lattleton would have big functions in Ireland later on as well. So um, an esteemed general as well. So, um, and obviously he had had quite a bit of a career in the Boer War, uh, which Gilbert, well, was very well keen on all those stories too. So he's very much convinced of the justice of the war. So um, they, and, and as was Neville, they were, well, they, they, were not going to take anything less but the, the absolute destruction of the Hun. They were uh, very, very angry about what happened. Um, so uh, there was little reasoning, apparently, um, what he can gather out of conversations. Now, when he joined up, he becomes uh, eventually um, second lieutenant and then lieutenant platoon commander. And um, apparently the colonel tells him, you're not responsible for 55 lives. You're responsible for 54. Yours doesn't count. You, your first loyalty is to your men. Now we have an awful lot of comments uh, that are, well, a bit humorous uh, by Appy Nash. I'll introduce you to Appy in a moment. Um, so here you can see uh, the barracks in older shot. And Appy Nash became his Batman. Not that much older, not more experienced or anything, but Appy did, well, did have a, a good pen as well. His first morning on parade was rather amusing. The platoon lined up and he inspected us, faint smiles on the faces of the boys. He then told us what he expected from us. First, obedience to orders. You must be properly dressed, clean shaved, spruce and smart. Then there were more giggles. Puzzled, he called me aside and asked the cause of this. I had to inform him that his cap with peak and badge should be facing to the front. His tie should not be holding his left ear up and that the tapes of his putties were for tying up. I let him see himself in a mirror and he was quite shocked. So uh, we do have a few ex-officers from the British Army amongst us. Uh, I'm not sure if this sounds familiar or not. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so uh, he might not be very well dressed, but he does have that born leadership in him. On the 3rd of September, he rides from the training camp uh, near, near Aldershot to his family. Whatever else in true, is true of life, one thing is certain, that I am doing the right thing now and that every ounce in me must go to it till the end. The war is amazingly inspiring and all of the Belgian stories and all of the devilish and damnable horrors that these swine inflicts on women and children make one long to get there. Though I don't flatter myself, I should find war congenial. It's all magnificent, really. It's purging us all. I can't imagine wanting to be a peace soldier, but it's wonderful to be doing it now. And I still can't help reading the war news and the casualty list without a sense of wondering whether someday one's turn will come and whether it is possible to imagine a finer thing happening to me, which at the same time would deal forever with the troubles of difficulties in this world. The difficulties in this world, he might refer to uh, a failed romance at the time as well. Uh, obviously, with his political life, he, you know, he had made not only friends, but also a few enemies, if you like. And, um, well, his lifestyle was quite luxurious, so not everyone thanked him for that either. But, well, that might refer just to that. So it was um, purging, as he said. It was something different, a new beginning. It seems also that he wasn't a great shot at first. Um, Nash recalls that with five rounds rapid fire, um, that Nash had two balls and three inners. Gilbert, firing on the net target, had about two outers and presented me with an outer. The other two were not rec uh, registered. So he, he, he's a lousy shot as well, but well, perhaps you know not the main thing for in his position. Then he related at mess that night and caused much merriment and leg pulling. That's what training's for, I presume. Now around Christmas, in their um, camp at uh, Trilford, uh, which is quite close to Winchester, uh, again, quite close to Aldershot, 
uh, with a pension, um, a retired tea farmer. He takes his platoon at least twice to Farnham Castle, uh, where they are entertained by the bishop. So I'm sure the men would have liked the the, the good, uh, well, to be wined and dined by the bishop. Um, it's quite a special Christmas for all of them. Now, the, um, they spend a bit more time training, obviously. 17th of May, Nash um, uh, drives him to Chelsea to say goodbye to one of his favorite nieces. She, he still gives her a silver cross as a farewell party. On 18th of May, they are at Farnham Castle for the very last time. And on the 19th of May, they cross the channel at night and camp the next day in huts around Boulogne. So here you see Nash, who uh, recalls an awful lot of this. Quite a young chap as well. Later, one of the presidents of Tok H. No surprises there. Most of the people we mentioned find their way back later in the story in Talbot House and Tok H, surprisingly, or, or perhaps not. Um, so here you see some of the rifle brigade. I've not been able to source a photograph of the exact battalion. You might recognize uh, some of the Kitchener Blue. They didn't have enough equipment to um, fit everyone with the proper uniform at first. Mm -hmm. And Gilbert in uniform, looking quite handsome, quite smart, but still very young. He is uh, 21. Mm -hmm. He does long for home. At times, one's thought flying back to all the precious things in England, a thousand times more precious now. I think of Farnham, Winchester, Oxford in summer. And one thinks of all the family and the happy times we had. The love that binds us all, and mother, and all she's to me. And I don't feel ashamed of wondering fairly often if I shall see them again, and if so, when. So here you see Farnham Castle in Christmas time. Now, for the people who are perhaps not as familiar with the, the area uh, in Belgium, uh, a quick run through uh, for all the guides. <laughs> Please correct me or uh, uh, go and have a beer. So here you see um, uh, Western Europe, if you like, a few countries marked on the map. Uh, I'll see, here we go. I learned this from uh, the Anglia lot last week. Here we go, the pointer. So there's a few big countries on the map. There's Germany, there's France, there's even a bit of England at the top. And there's three wee ones squashed in the middle. So there's Luxembourg, you know, two streets. We'll ignore it for now. We, we had the New Zealand ambassador here a few weeks ago. He'd driven through without noticing it was there, he told us. Um, <laughs> then there's the Netherlands. There's a very big thing you have to know with us Belgians. We ignore the Dutch. They don't exist to us. It's a football thing. So uh, we'll ignore the Netherlands as well. And then there's Belgium. Now, the only reason Belgium was allowed to exist, basically, is because it's a buffer in between all these bigger countries. Now, if the French don't like the, the Dutch, why not have the battle, you know, in someone else's backyard? Why don't we have it in Waterloo, for instance? It's so much easier to mess up someone else's country than your own. Now, the Germans and the French share a border at the bottom here, and obviously there was fighting going on here as well. But the German Schlieffenplan, as a lot of you will know, in camp, well, involved that Germany would invade, cut through Belgium, take the channel ports, Calais, Dunkirk, all of these, the Belgians, Ostend, Newport, and swing round, take Paris, and then attack from the behind. So it's a great plan, you know, until someone pointed out, hang on, it means going through Belgium. Oh, well, we'll ask them nicely, you know, dear cousin, can I get through? He asked twice, and our king said twice, sorry, you're not allowed through, neutrality and all that. Now, um, Luckily for us, a few other countries, slightly bigger than Belgium, came to our rescue. Um, how do I... Here we go. Now, the Belgian army, uh, 10 times the size of the current one, but still next to nothing, was driven from the Belgian border to the furthest country, county, sorry, of the country. Now, the name of the county is called West Hook. Translate that to English and you get the Far West. So there's nothing here, uh, you know, when we get uh, some of the school groups through, they ask where's McDonald's, where's KFC's, where's the movie theater? You know, it's all at least an hour's drive from this. Uh, this is the end of the world, let's say. <laughs> now the Belgian army hid behind uh, a river and a railway embankment in this area here. And they had one smart Belgian, only the one, and he was able to flood the entire, with, with some engineers, obviously, 
flood the entire valley here between the river and the railway embankment. So it's a bit blurry, but um, it was uh, incredibly infect effective because it prevented the Germans from pushing through. The floods were at places only 50 meters wide, but at some places up to a kilometer. So you couldn't get through. The one place in Belgium that hadn't been flooded entirely is this bit around the town of Ypres, Popperinge just behind it, the southern part of that county. Now, why didn't it flood? Well, first of all, it's too far from the coast. And secondly, and now you'll all laugh, this part of Belgium is famous for its hills and mountains. Um, <laughs> I know, yes, I know a lot of you don't believe that. Um, we, we're very proud of them, so I, I have to mention them, you know. Uh, it's all we have, sorry. Now, the pink bit you see on the map, this is the Allies for most of the war, over 100 nationalities, especially at the time Gilbert was here, there would have been a very big mixture of Indian soldiers all the, and, and even a handful of Kiwis, you know, enlisted with the British Army. He had, he had people from all corners of the globe, really, at that time, 14, 15. And the green bit, that's the German Imperial Army. So that's also a few countries, but let's say that's mainly Germany. So uh, what should I point out? So the main cities uh, are Iper, Wiper is Ypres, however you like to pronounce it. Uh, that's where the Menin Gate is at. I'm sure lots of you have heard of it. Uh, this is, if you like, in simple terms, this is hell on earth. And then you have one place behind hell. The first stop behind hell is Popperinge or Pops. Has lots of fancy nicknames, for instance, um, Little Soho or Petit Paris. Uh, now, I can assure you uh, most certainly that it doesn't resemble either, but it was all they had back then, poppering it or pops. So this became heaven on earth for the men, whilst this was hell, Eper, because it was so close to the front line. Now, to make it more complicated still, the front line doesn't go in a straight line, it goes in two semicircles, as you can see. So um, the nasty thing about the semicircle is well, the salient, as they called it, this bulge you see here, is it means you're surrounded from three sides. Now the salient would always remain, it would become smaller or bigger again, but the salient always remained around Ypres. So a very dangerous place. So here you see the town center of Ypres just before the war. One trick to always recognize if it's before or after is the spire of the cathedral, which is a small one. So bustling market town, uh, almost forgotten in history. But this is the largest Gothic building in the world that is not a church. Obviously, the current one is a fake, is a copy, because this was flattened. Now, very, very briefly, uh, 1914, we had the first Battle of Ypres. What does it involve? Well, basically, this half a circle you see gets shortened. To take out their frustration, they start shelling the Ypres town center. You can see the cloth holland flames. Skip some of this. Second Battle of Ypres, uh, just before Gilbert gets here, you have the first use of chlorine gas in the northern part of the salient. So you can see a huge chunk was bitten out of that salient. And as the days and weeks progressed, the Germans would use gas several more times. And each time they would get closer to the Ypres town center by doing so, by launching these attacks. Now the sole British response, well, it's not the sole British response, but the main response by a lot of the the senior officers is counterattack. If a lot of these counterattacks are really, you know, in vain. They don't achieve anything, but still, that's that's the method. You know, they still always, very soon after one attack, counterattack. This is exactly what happened with Gilbert as well. So you can see some of the first gas victims on the photographs. Jesus. Well, the first gas masks <laughs> might look familiar with what we're all going to wear soon, I think. Right, and as time progressed, um, just double check my notes. Um, as time progressed, this is what the front line would look like. This half a circle is still there, but it gets awfully close. To give you an idea, the distance from Bellavar, you see the green dot here, and that red dot, uh, let's say the cathedral, on a bicycle, uh, I'll embarrass myself perhaps now, but uh, let's say you could do that in, in, in uh, it's not even 10 minutes, it's uh, between five and 10 minutes. 
uh, I hear some of the Anglian guides have been training over the, the lockdown. I haven't. <laughs> now, Gilbert also goes and visits the town center of Ypres. He joins one of the staff, officer, Harry, staff officers, Harry Oldham, um, on an excursion, let's say. And he writes the following. It's, it, this is quite a, a special one. I find it very hard to give you an account of uh, my expedition, which fairly describes it. It was, to start with, intensely moving. One visited the spot where since October last year, many British our soldiers had perished violently. Everybody almost connects to the place with some <laughs> separate individual. It's a quiet little provincial town, partly industrious and partly just beautiful when, with its cathedral and cloth hall. The trenches were drawn in a close circle around it and perhaps never have efforts so great been made to effect anything that the German efforts to burst these few miles. One is partly moved, therefore, and partly amazed. I despair of telling you what the place looks like. It beggars description. The suburbs of the town are comparatively intact, though most houses have been shelled. The whole inside is simply a desolation. You cannot imagine it being rebuilt. Imagine, you know, it is rebuilt these days, luckily. We walked through the streets and found not one house which had not, was not a mere mess of ruins or a pile of bricks. Of course, there were fragments that remained. Some of the old familiar advertisements are someone for a singer sewing machine. Other than anything is to go into one of these ruined houses. They nearly also show signs of being abandoned in panic, without their owners waiting so much as to pick up anything. Half-eaten meals are on the tables, clothes lying confusion on the floor. Most people take away little tiny bits of loot. I put a few lace bobbins in my pocket. And then we came into the famous Place, the great, the great market square. The cloth hall, roofless and ruined, lies all the way down one side and the cathedral is just beyond it. The whole square is covered with loose stones and rubble, as everything else in town. There's not a living soul to be seen, except passing British soldiers. We wandered through the cloth hole and saw the fragments of the famous uh, frescoes, and oddly came upon two hearses, pushed inside there by some chance. I didn't go into the cathedral till the next day. It's not quite as big as Southwark, but must have been very lovely. Now it's got no roof. There are huge holes in the walls and the aisles are heaps of high and fallen masonry. I saw two shells holes, which made one gate, one by the cloth hole and one at the Easter end of the cathedral. The largest being 50 yards round, I measured. Nothing has brought the war home to me as much as this town. Its people had no connection with the war, no interest in the war, and their lovely home has been gutted until it's unrecognizable. I wish everybody in England could see it. Harry and I remembered that the last expedition we made together was to Oxford. I tried to think of the peace, the loveliness of Magdalen and Christchurch, and that May evening, and to contrast it with the blackened ruins we were now seeing. It left a big impression on him. Here you see. There's some joyous news as well. He goes to Popperingham, he goes to one of the um, uh, breweries there and uh, is allowed to have a bath and he swims in it like a young kitten, he says, in the, one of these big vats. The first hot bath he had since leaving England. That's about two weeks he's been here, it's, which is lucky, you know. I, I've read accounts of soldiers being here for three months not having a bath. So... Um, there were some interesting stories going around at the time as well on the quality of the Belgian beer. Some said it was uh, that thick uh, that the locals made it into beer afterwards and sold it twice the money. They also could not use soap in these fats usually because the horses had to drink the water when they were done. So, uh, well, don't, don't expect any luxury. Now back to the map briefly to give you an idea uh, where we're at. Uh, with most of our story. Um, Gilbert's first service briefly at saint Ilois. Mm -hmm. So there's an, uh, a period of time he serves in this area here. Um, 
just check if I have any, if I left anything out for you there. No, so he first serves in St. Ilbar for a few weeks. He also has to guide some um, uh, groups of soldiers to the trenches, which makes him very nervous because he always gets lost, apparently. So whenever they bring up rations, he shows the way, apparently. Uh, on his first uh, week in the trenches, one of his um, men in his platoon is shot in the head, which, which makes a very big impact on him as well. Later on, they find a... Um, um, a trench deserted with 25 German and French bodies in it, and he is well ordered to uh, rebury them. Uh, obviously, he wouldn't have done the burying himself, but he would have been there. And again, that you know, on a 21 year old, that made a apparently a very big impression. So, he often writes to his brother Neville, who's who's out here as well. Uh, so, Neville is close by usually, he's a um, chaplain at this moment. So, uh, and his brother tries to put him at ease. Now, after serving in St. Eloy in this area here, which is a mere hamlet today, I think I've got a photograph of that coming up as well. Here we go. So it's, it's 15 houses, half of them built the last few years. It's very small. Would have been heavily fought over for the coming years. He, after fighting there, he goes, well, he's sent to this area here, to the village of Zellebeken, and more specifically to the hamlet of Bellewaard. Bellewaard is an old chateau. And today, most people will know Bellawarda for its amusement park that's there. I'll show you that as well uh, later on. But uh, all the locals know it as Hoho. Very difficult for us to pronounce. It's impossible in English. Uh, Hoho. Most, most people in the UK say Hooge. Mm -hmm. um, now, Hooge, <laughs> Hooge means huge. It means high. It's on a hill, a Belgian hill. It's about 40 meters above sea level. Uh, but for us Belgians, again, that, that is huge. Hence, we call it the Hoho. Um, so Hoho had a huge chateau, um, which, which goes back several centuries, actually, located on it, uh, which would have been in the middle of the theme park today. So here you can see an ancient, well, a drawing from the 1800s. Nice lake from photograph, uh, picture from 1817. So owned by the bar barons of Bellewarde, uh, who are also the local mayors. It's a bit like a Downton Abbey story, really. Uh, now, when war breaks out, the current uh, Baron de Vink mm -hmm. is an interesting chap. He, he, wants, he wants some of the excitement. So he goes in his motorcycle with his chauffeur and he takes a shotgun. He's go, he goes hunting Germans. And he actually caught, catches one, apparently. It's like hunting for rabbits, he thinks. He <laughs> shoots one, then feels pity, takes him home and tells his wife, please nurse this man. Mm -hmm. So you can imagine his wife wasn't too keen on any of that. But um, very soon, uh, the fighting draws comes a lot closer. And on the 29th of October, um, I think uh, just before the first shells start landing on the chateau, he is ordered himself out because the chateau is commandeered by uh, the British army, uh, who think it's a lovely place to have a, a staff office, obviously. Now, the German, uh, the Prussian guard is about to break through down the road from the chateau. So an urgent meeting is called between the 1st and 2nd Division staff officers on the 31st of October, around lunchtime. Here's a testimony by a local, by a Lieutenant Colonel uh, Swinton. As I drove away, I turned round to look at the chateau of Hooge, standing a little to the north of the road. The approach was packed with big fancy cars, a splendid advertisement to catch the eye of any off-chance enemy airmen who happened to wander above and proclaim that this was a British headquarters. So um, it didn't take long. Uh, soon afterwards, at 1.30, the first shell, 5.9, landed in the garden. Most generals ran to the room, thought it was something impressive to have a look at. Second shell landed on top of their heads. So uh, let's say half the staff was taken out. And again, this is credit to the professionalism of the British Army because the men uh, didn't need the generals to hold their line. They, um, they were able to uh, well, recover and, and, and keep on fighting, uh, often outnumbered 10 to 1 down uh, that road in Hilleveld that day. So an impressive account. Sir Samuel Lomax, commander of the 1st Division, for instance, was critically injured. Uh, his colleague, uh, Sir Charles Monroe, severely concussed, commander of 2nd Division. So uh, this had huge impact. 
So the Baron actually left someone behind locally, a nephew, I think, to check that the British didn't steal the silverware or the curtains or the carpets. And I think a year later, one of, you know, uh, you know, Gilbert's friends showed him a photograph of what was left of the chateau. And, uh, well, it was hardly anything left. And they, um, they called it a day. <laughs> the nephew went back and said, well, there's, there's not two bricks left standing. Let's, um, let's not start counting the silverware now. So here you can see where the shells would have landed on those generals and the, the results. The farm nearby goes up in flames as well. So this is a trench map from, from much later, but it gives you an IG. So a um, few interesting places. Here we have the main roundabout still there today, Hellfire Corner. And they named everything after local places, Beer Crossroads, for instance. We have Oxford Road close by as well. Um, Hoosh, you can see here, this is the hamlet on top of the hill. And the stables are here, and the chateau is just there, or what is left of it. The red lines are all German trenches, but as I said, from a later time. And the wood at the bottom here, this is Zouave wood. The wood doesn't stand anymore there today. It, it's disappeared. It was never replanted. But the other wood is still there. This here, all of this is sanctuary wood. So sanctuary wood still standing today. There's something, well, of a museum there as well, if you can call it that. Um, and Zouave wood just here. Zouave wood was, is going to be very important in our story. You'll see lots of this coming, well, slides. Now, several battles take place around here. As I said, in 1915, we had the second Battle of Ypres and always these front lines coming from the right-hand side of your screen, from the eastern side, they're always pushed closer towards that roundabout and the town center of Ypres, which lies just beyond on this side here. Now, there's several battles, as I said, I won't go through all of them. Uh, 24th of May, for instance, the, tr the front line arrives at Hohe. And, um, there's a huge, fierce battle that goes on uh, with the Princess Patricia's, for instance, Canadians. An interesting account is on the 16th of June when the British launched the diversion action and they try and retake the German line. So everything in red is the German front line, very vaguely marked, um, halfway through the field there. And the blue line, this is the British uh, front line, again, quite vaguely. Uh, the account is most famous for on the 16th of June for Captain, well, not most famous, but one of the famous actions was by uh, Noel Chavas, mm -hmm. who was the, the doctor of the Liverpool Scottish, ran uh, time and time again into no man's land at nightfall to get his wounded soldiers out. He would later uh, receive the Victoria Cross and Bar for similar actions close by. So uh, quite an interesting fellow to, to just mention Noel Chavas. I, uh, yeah, some more photographs. So the attack uh, failed, <laughs> let's say. They did not get on top of the hill again. They got a bit closer, but not much. So this is what left, is left of the chateau at the time. Um, the chateau had the same size of the cloth hole in Ypres, to give you an idea. It was one of the largest ones we had in the region. So that farm you see in the background, 5th, 25th of May, what is left of it. The view Noel Chavas would have had roughly, but this is quite a vague photograph, but this is the view they would have had looking up on that hill. So that hill isn't huge, as I said. There's a, a 10, 50 meter um, difference in, uh, in height. Some action photos from the day. So one of the problems was that the men were shelled by friendly fire, so hence the, the flag to signal their positions uh, to their own artillery in vain on this occasion. Noel Chavas who would sadly also not survive the war. Another action takes place on the 2nd of June, um, around uh, the chateau and the stables, especially in this end here. So the Germans uh, managed to, um, uh, hang on, the Germans managed to uh, retake a lot of the chateaus and the stables. Um, the Indian cavalry send in, even in the evening, dismounted, obviously and they retake the stables. So this, this distance is, is 300 meters the, between the chateau and the stables, but the fighting in this area here is, is enormous. 
Soon afterwards, on the 4th of July, a month later, Gilbert is for the first time sent to this hot zone. He writes of it. I felt, comf comf I felt comforted the other day out here when Neville came to see me. I was saying that one felt such an atom out here. And if one was killed, one would only be like a bit of sand on the seashore. Neville said the thing to thin of wars was penitent. Penin Thief saying to our Lord on the cross, Lord, remember me. And then the infinite graciousness of the answer. The greatest drama of the world was going on, yet Jesus had time to think of an obscure criminal. Let's say he wasn't feeling, you know, his best. We had a hell of a time at Hoosh. It's certainly the deuce of a place. It was very trying. We had a lot of nervous breakdowns. Come and see me when you can. He pleads with his brother on the 28th of July, two days before his death, actually. Now, the British who are in the low ground here, I'll just fast forward. Here you see the, the hill itself today. So this is Hoosh. And roughly where I point the light at now, yeah, a little bit more to the right and, and at the back, this is where the British would have driven a tunnel underneath. So these men you see here are uh, members of the 175th Tunneling Company. So they, uh, hang on, what did they do? They uh, drove a tunnel, excuse me, they drove a tunnel from the low ground, roughly from underneath the men, well, next to the men road, the culvert, that area, underneath um, all of this, and uh, packed it full of aminal, first time apparently aminal was used, and uh, they blew it up on the 19th of July. So the crater they created had a, a, a lip of four and a half meters. It was uh, five meters deep and 37 meters wide. So it was a huge crater that was blown up. So the lieutenant in charge of the tunnelers uh, was doing a great job. Um, and the Middlesex regiment were very keen to occupy the crater as soon as they got the chance, but they were too hasty. Apparently 10 of their own men got killed by the rubble, that, the debris that was still falling because they were too close during the attack. Now, for the people who are not used to seeing this, uh, for, for, well, the guides amongst us, this, we all know it is there, but the cemetery we see here is one of the largest ones in the Ypres salient. This is the Hoosh Crater Cemetery. Um, I think it's the fourth largest Commonwealth cemetery we have. And uh, if you include the German ones, it's, it's somewhere top 10. Uh, so it gives you an idea of the bigger ones then. Okay, hang on. Yeah, here you see the crater. So the, the, the technique they used to do the, to dig these tunnels was clay kicking. So you lay back on a wooden plank and you kick with your feet. There is more muscle in your feet. It's more, well, comfortable is the wrong word, but it's, it's easier to work because you cannot stand up. Tunnels are about four and a half feet high, four feet wide. And everything has to do, be done in absolute silence because if the enemy hears you, well, you, you've had it. They can dig a tunnel down as they did. Um, right, so here you see some photographs of that crater. And they did get comfortable in the crater. So some hazy pictures, but you can see they're making entrances to tunnels as well, to shelters. So um, the crater is uh, being inhabited by this stage. Tunnels under, running underground as well. Some of this surfaced actually when they were building a new aqua park down the road at the theme park. So the tunnels are still there. Um, the British dug tunnels as well. These are all photos from later in the war. There's an Australian uh, advanced dressing station underground as well. This is a great photograph to use in the, when you talk about the medical evacuation, for instance. Um, all of that is underneath that road still today. Yeah, I'll skip the Boothby story for now. It would drag us too far. Not all of these tunnelers survived. So there's a memorial there in that vicinity as well for some of the men who died uh, in these tunnel actions. Now, one of them has his love letters donated to Talbot House to the archives recently. So that should be another presentation perhaps soon. The Boothby letters. So an aerial photograph, you can see the lake, the Bellawarda Lake. 
and the main the Menin Road, the main road on the photograph that runs through Hellfire Corner, which would have been at the bottom of this photograph. So again, the Menin Road. And all of these lines you see are trench lines that zigzag, and every white dot is a shell crater. So it's hard to count them even. And the big blob here, that's the Hoosh crater. Again, what's left of the chateau, it's stables. So for, to give you an idea, for the people who know the area, the stables are the, the current uh, um, Hoge Chateau Hotel, which I know some of you uh, uh, very much like staying at. <laughs> and then um, the chateau itself would have been where you have uh, the theme park with the big rides. And the Hoosh Crater Museum today would be roughly over here along the Menon Road. I hope I say that correctly. Um, it might be a bit further on the left as well. We'd have to have a better look. Yeah, some more photographs and, and sketches. Again, note, so this is the Menon Road. You have the forest, Zouave Wood and Sanctuary Wood. Right. Now on the 30th of uh, July, um, the Germans are at play again. So several quotes here of what happened that night to the colleagues from the 8th Battalion, the Rifle Brigade. So Sev Gilbert Talbot is a member of the 7th Battalion. He's actually here at Hoosh that afternoon on the, on the 29th of July, 1915. But he is relieved and he marches back through the trenches to a village of Vlamerdingen. So he doesn't see this. He does hear of it later on. But I have to mention this battle because it has a huge, well, it's the reason why he was called up. So these, the next quotes are by 2nd Lieutenant uh, Carey, 8th Company of the 8th Rifle Brigade. Bombing was frequent, sniping incessant. But worst of all, the Germans used to give the crater and its immediate neighborhood thrice daily strifes with their heavy minenwerfer. So they're mortars. This was the most alarming implement of a frightfulness that our fellows had yet knocked up against. Apart from the number of people it had blown to bits, the explosion alone was so terrific that anyone within a hundred yards radius was liable to lose his reason after a few hours of it. And the 7th Battalion had had to send down the line several men in state of gibbering helplessness. So that's the Gilbert's unit. There were men were ordered to edge away from the craters whenever mini started. The next bit talks about the, the night. So usually at night, things can get quite interesting because of the darkness, obviously. The relief was complete shortly after midnight. Gilbert was out. The night was quiet, too quiet. There had been very little shelling on that way up, for which we are duly thankful. But the absence of the sniper's bullets as we filled up the community trench from Zouave Wood from the bottom to the front line so if they're here was something more than a surprise the continued silence after we got to the front line the dark line here became uncanny after an hour we were settled in I decided that a grenade or two a bomb or two lobbed over to the Bosch trench running close to the crater might disturb him we waited. No reply. Can you believe it? At short intervals, we sent over two more. This ought to rouse them, we said. Again, no reply. There was something sinister about this. It was now about half an hour before dawn, and at the order for stand to, I started on the extreme right of my bit of line. All the men got up, fixed bayonets, to ensure that all the men were lining up. I remember having a strong persistent as I plodded up to the line that I would never come back to it alive. The silence after we got into the line became uncanny. Oh, hang on. But, um, about half an hour later, the sudden hissing sound and a bright crimson flare over the Kramer crater turned the whole scene red. I saw three or four distinct jets of flame, like a line of powerful fire hoses spraying fire instead of water shoot around across my trench. Then every noise under heaven broke out. 
trench mortars and bombs, machine guns firing, shrapnel falling, and high explosive shells. It was a death trap to stay where we were, and our company commander gave the order to get the remnant of my platoon back to the support line. About a dozen men were all we could find. Those who had faced the flame attack were never seen again. C Company of the 8th Rifle Brigade to the right of the crater seemed, seemed to have been almost completely obliterated very early on the attack. 8th Rifle Brigade went into the line with 24 officers, 745 other ranks. It lost 19 officers, 469 other ranks killed, wounded, and missing. More than half of those men did not return. So what happened is the Germans for the very first time um, used uh, a new weapon. So the weapon uh, we all know today as a flamethrower was still an experimental phase. <laughs> to be honest, it was by no means the, a really new invention. Things like that had been used. It had been used on the French apparently as well. But on the British, most likely this was the first of one of the very first uh, times this was um, used. So um, there's no photographs of it either. So I do have some others I can show you. Um, here we go. So these are from a later period. You can tell by the helmets. But it would have been incredibly impressive. Don't forget this was at night when they did it. So uh, it would have been absolutely terrifying. So during the attack, um, Gilbert loses one of his dear friends, Lieutenant Keith Ray, 26 years old. So uh, they went to Belial College. He went to Belial College, but he knew, uh, obviously, Gilbert from Oxford as well. So uh, he uh, founded one of the boys' clubs in Oxford, and perhaps that's where they, uh, they encountered, let's say. <coughs> um, there's a memorial to Lieutenant uh, Ray at Sanctuary Wood Cemetery. I'll show you that in a minute as well. So uh, one of... He already lost one of his good friends. There's also a VC awarded that day in Victoria Cross to Sydney Woodruff. So um, I'll just read you some of the citation. At the same time, Sydney was killed. Another no, hang on. Um, Second Lieutenant Woodruff's position was heavily attacked with bombs from the flanks and sub subsequently from the rear, but he managed to defend his post until all his bombs were exhausted. He then skillfully withdrew his remaining men and immediately led them forward into a counterattack under intense rifle and machine gun fire. He was killed whilst in the act of cutting uh, barbed wire. So um, he, you know, he kept true to his men, kept true to his post, and he was awarded uh, Victoria Cross. His body was not recovered, but we have to add that um, Neville Talbot did see his body when crawling through no man's land a few weeks later. They did spot his body, but didn't have the time, the means to carry it back. So um, there's a fair chance he's buried on one of the local cemeteries as an unknown soldier, together with Lieutenant Ray, or uh, he might still be in those fields today. There's thousands of bodies physically still missing today. There's some gruesome stories of the day as well. You know, some of the bodies were uh, put on pikes and thrown, you know, and pushed into the air. Uh, one of them had a sign attached to it, one of Kitchener's bastards, apparently. Um, so let's say it wasn't always very chivalry. So the flamethrower would have been most likely in Klein Flammenwerfer, so uh, one of the experimental things they were using uh, that could um, do bursts of fire 18 meters away. So that would have, you know, got halfway through no man's land, if not, if not to the enemy line. So here you go. This is the memorial of uh, Lieutenant Ray. Now, uh, as a lot of the memorials in, you know, the middle of the previous century fell into disrepair, uh, and let's face it, there were an awful lot of them, uh, often on private property. It was decided by the family and Tubby Clayton from Talbot House to put this one at St. Truwood so the Commonwealth War Graves Commission could look after it. So this also links up perhaps with, well, um, people still around these days, still people are still putting up memorials in the Ypres salient. 
One organization that's not a big fan of this is the Imperial and the Commonwealth War Graves Commission because they often know that give it 10, 20, 50 years, they'll be the ones looking after it because the people who put the memorial there are no longer present. So uh, I know Ed Lewis is watching. We put up a Christmas truce memorial together. The commission also wasn't very keen uh, on putting it anywhere else than on, you know, at the hostel uh, where we eventually put it because they, um, they just know, give it 10, 20 years, we'll be looking after it. Same happened to the Island of Ireland Peace Park, several others, to this one of Lieutenant Ray. So um, I'm sure Chubby uh, had his ways of getting his will done. So it was taken care of. And there it is today at Sanctuary Wood Cemetery. So I know a lot of you have passed it. I'm not sure you know the story behind it. It's one of Gilbert's mates as well. Now, where is Gilbert Talbot in all of this? Gilbert walked back during this attack all the way to Vlamertingen. He has just arrived at the rest camp. We don't know the exact location. There's no uh, mention besides the village name in the regimental diary. He arrives there at 3.45 a.m., about the time the attack would start. At 4.45, he was put on alert again. They had done well and they knew it. The colonel had said as much and he was not a man to waste words. They had left the trench as safe as it could be made. And now they had been relieved. They were out of the danger, slogging wearily along the road to the rest camp. They were sick of sleepness, their shoulders aching under their heavy packs. Their feet were sore, their clothes, which they had not changed for a fortnight, were filthy and lousy. They no longer attempted to march in step or to hold themselves erect. Each man limped across as best as he could. They were dead tired, but they were not dejected. They were going to rest. They were going to sleep long and soundly, undisturbed by bombs. They were going to drink their fill of good hot tea and thin Belgian beer. They were going to get stews of fresh meat. And it goes on and on. They were apparently very much looking forward to all of this. Suddenly, a motorcycle appeared at express speed. The colonel was roused, the company passed, stack valises by platoon and get ready to march off. The Germans have broken through. The men were two days to talk. Mechanically, they packed their great coats into their valises and stacked them. The Germans broken through, all their work wasted. Incredible. No time to grumble. This meant business. They forgot their fatigue, their thirst, their hunger. Their minds were full of the flock at home whom they might not see again. And the struggle that they lay before them. An officer caught the eye of a corporal and both smiled and felt there was some curious link between them. The captain said a few words to his men during a halt. Some trenches had been lost. It was their brigade that lost them. For the honor of the brigade and of the new army, they must try and retake them. The men listened in silence. Their faces were set. Tired and washed, not fed or rested, and probably with a clear idea of what was likely to be in store for them, they marched 13 kilometers straight back to the hot zone. So doing that trek on foot twice a night on an empty stomach, I can assure you, living locally, it, it is, you know, it's a good distance. Uh, off the top of my head, uh, Google it and correct me. Off the top of my head, it's something like um, uh, 10, 10 kilometers, so 10 to 12 kilometers, I would say. Um, so and they also didn't go in a straight line, we know, because they uh, had to take a few diversions in this area here. They also went up to Lil Gate to get their orders. There was headquarters and the ramparts there. <laughs> um, hang on. Uh, so this is Nash talking, the Batman of Gilbert Talbot. I called Le Gilbert up at once. And after the first sleepy moment, he was in very good spirits. And he walked off after only a cup of tea, scarcely any food. Some had bits of chocolate and biscuits with them. The last hour or so, Gilbert and me walked on alone ahead of the rest. Shelling became more violent as we got nearer the Zouave wood. Gilbert said to me, we're going up all together to a warm shop. I don't suppose many of us will come back. He also tells an awful lot of stories of his childhood, apparently, at Nash. So they, these blokes have known each other for half a year, and suddenly he starts telling very personal details about his life to, to his Batman. So he, he perhaps shows he was nervous as well, or, you know, saw what was coming, obviously. They arrive back at 11.30 uh, at the Ramparts in Ypres. 
So this is the mode of Epress or little gate is here. They get their issue with orders. They get a little break. At 1.40 p.m. they arrive at Zuavut, which would be roughly here on the map. At 2 o'clock, a feeble 45-minute bombardment kicks off. A new jumping off line on the edge of the wood is created. So here you see Zuav wood, and they create a new jumping off line on the edge of the wood. So you see lots of lines on this. Um, lots of these lines are uh, resemble trenches, mainly British trenches, because remember the British were on top of this hill. They blown a crater, they'd occupied the crater. So this is the British front line. Overnight, the Germans launched this flamethrower attack and taken hold of the crater and all of the top bits here. So the front line would have been roughly along these lines. This is where the Germans roughly would have had their positions. Still trenches, communication trenches are running up the hill, running up that slope because, um, well, obviously they had been dug before they were used until the previous night. Gilbert would have walked in them uh, when he was relieved. The conditions of the wood were unspeakable. Trees were, trees were, with no leaves left, had fallen from shells like splinkins over the other. And there were corpses of wounded men and huge pits and horror and desolation beyond description. We all waited from 2 to 2.40 while our side bombardment, to which the Germans answered furiously as many men were killed and wounded in the wood. At first, Gilbert went up and down the line, cheering on his men, but at last no words could be heard. So great was the noise and he went and sat a little apart, on the right, with his head a little bent. I think he was praying. He looked constantly at his watch. So Gilbert's battalion, uh, company is given the objective of G9, which is here, and uh, even G10 over here. So this is where they have to get up to. And in order to get there, they have their eyes set on this old communication trench which provides protection would have been deep not sure how deep probably not too deep um and they try i have to well they, they're they're going along this line this is where gilbert would have been at sitting and praying the attack is scheduled for 2 45 p.m not everyone goes through this old communication trench obviously there's a few thousand men who empty, uh, who walk through no man's land, basically, try and get up the hill. Now, what is not on this map here uh, is barbed wire. There is some barbed wire marked at the... No, there is no barbed wire to my... No, there's no barbed wire, barbed wire marked on this map. There would have been plenty of it, though. Um, and especially also in these parts here. I have always wondered, perhaps some of the guides can, can give me their opinion, if there would have been barbed wire in this vicinity here, which we know there was, my guess is that the Germans wouldn't have had time to put it up. They'd only been there a morning. So I'm confident that this is British barbed wire that would be in the way, in their way now, as they wanted to attack uphill. Just check. Do we have anyone else joining? No, that's it. At 2.45, Nash recounts, he blew the whistle, which was assigned to charge. And at once the men, only 16 of the 60, remember, of the 55, 16 were left. He leapt out and rushed forward. Gilbert, followed closely by myself, he told me to keep near him, headed them a few yards on. With the words, come on, my lads, this is our day. Soon he came upon the old barbed wire fencing, which was beginning to cut when he was hit in the neck. He fell over the wire fencing. He was badly hit in the left arm. I was, sorry, I was badly hit in the left arm, so Nash is wounded as well. At the same moment as my master and dashed forward, wrenched out his bandages and turned Gilbert gently on his back and then tried to bind up the fatal wound in his neck. His blue eyes opened wide and he saw me and gave me a bright smile, then turned a little over and died. While my right hand was on Gilbert's breast pocket, to lay him down, a bullet pierced the third finger. He was later up amputated and went right through Gilbert's secret case, and I suppose through his heart. So the attack in general fails 
it doesn't go well. I'll, I'll give you some figures in a minute, but I won't go through all the details of who else got killed. But uh, So my, my guess is that Gilbert only got halfway. I'll show you on an aerial photograph where we think uh, this would have happened. So he wouldn't have got very far at all. So there's a little lull in the fighting 15 minutes later, as the as clearly very few of the troops have managed to get, get up the hill. Everyone is forced to retire. An awful lot of the Royal Rifle Corps um, battalions are involved uh, in the attacks throughout the month here. They still, they still have a memorial there as well. Even the Royal Engineers are thrown into, uh, into battle, into the fray. So here you see uh, a drawing of the attack. One thing that startled me, and I, I did double check it, and you can see the writing at the bottom. Uh, some of the historians might, uh, might know or might correct me. Kilted soldiers, to my knowledge, as far as I've seen, there were no Scottish units involved in this particular counterattack. But again, a lot of artistic license with these, uh, with these drawings at the time. Um, one battle looked very much the same as the other, I'm sure. You had to give the audience back home something to watch. This is the view from Zouave Wood you would have today. The crater would have been roughly over here. The stables there, the chateau behind it. So the old um, Bond Street um, communication trench would have run most likely somewhere through this field here. I would uh, need to do an overlay with linesmen. I'm sure some of the guides have it to check actually if this walking path that runs through it isn't exactly Bond Street. Um, I think it gets very close. Someone actually showed it to me once. So my guess is that Gilbert, before he even got to what is today, Hoosh Crater Cemetery, would have been killed in action. His objective for the day would have been the houses just on the left here. That's where he would have gone. But uh, obviously he didn't make it. So it is a fair bit of terrain to run through. It is very open um, as well. It would have been exposed. And uh, the barbed wire, well, would obviously have prevented them to make a, a speedy attack. There we go. So Zouave Wood doesn't exist today. It would have been over here. And this is, I think, the area where we can position Gilbert um, when he died. So more maps of the day. So you can see old Bond Street, new Bond Street. They had to give the places a name, you know, anything they knew from back home. The people of the Wipers Times Trench Magazine were very fond of this area. They were in this area at that time. No, they were not here yet, but they were in that area later on an awful lot of, um, of the time and um, used a lot of the place names. And Gilbert again. Now, word of Gilbert uh, reached um, a lot of the senior officers quite quickly. Uh, Nash himself, here we go, Nash himself has been wounded five times, can you imagine? Uh, he loses one of his fingers and he gets this distinguished uh, combat medal uh, for, you know, his commitment to his officers. Um, so uh, Nash would always recall the event and, you know, very, very sad that he could not save him, let alone retrieve his body. So Nash is rushed to hospital as well. And uh, remains in touch. He becomes the vice president of Tok H. Can you imagine? He has a very big connection with All Hallows in London. So uh, Tubby and Neville had a way of recruiting people. Um, so Nash certainly deserved uh, their attention. So we found, actually, yeah, this, this proves it. Um, um, Tubby left us a huge filing cabinet. We still have to digitize. But we had a brief look, and who did we find? Appy, Nash. Uh, this um, was put together by the secretaries of Tubby. He had four working around the clock. Uh, clock. Uh, you can see addresses changed. Um, he has a brother as well. well. We should try and see if the brother is still alive. Uh, a son, if the son is still alive. So here we go. Appy's son works at Department Lucian. There we go. So we have thousands of these cards which have been recently donated to Talbot House with a wealth of information. So Tubby kept in touch with all of them. 
in later life. Now, how does Neville hear the news? Um, so he sends telegrams backwards and forwards to ask for advice. This is what he gets in return. I'm afraid there are, seems to be no doubt that Lieutenant Talbot was killed. One man in his company states that he saw him fall whilst leaving his platoon through some wire. And it's certain in his own mind he is dead. A corporal since wounded also stated that he saw him fall dead. Shot through the head. All efforts to find his body failed. Signed, Staff Captain 40, uh, 41st HB. Now, fighting continues here. You see map 9th of August. I won't go into detail, but let's say this wasn't the end of Hoosh. It would see a lot more fighting in the coming months and years. Uh, not just with the British, also the Canadians close by at Mount Sorel. So this is what the area looks like uh, at the time. Um, now, Neville obviously uh, could not rest. He had to uh, try and recover his body, the body of his brother. So he also left us these accounts of that. I wasn't allowed by the 14th Divisional HQ to go up on the 31st, but I managed to get up all right on the night of the 1st of August. I'm pretty sure I got the info about the point from which Gilbert and his platoon uh, advanced, from a sergeant who'd survived in his company. Sergeant Shepard, perhaps? Someone who's going to get a mention later on. I remember seeing the remains of the shattered rifle brigade after they'd been relieved. Dear Colonel McLaughlin, in tears over the loss of his boys. It grew dusk and I made up my mind to crawl out the necessary 30 yards. The German trench in front, which was being shelled, was about 150 yards away. So you see, Gilbert didn't get very far. I went on hands and knees, lying flat as the flares went up, and there just past the wire lay what I was looking for. Anyhow, the first time I tried, just about dusk, I got into no man's land, found the body of young Woodrow VC, and then found Gilbert's body. It was very hot weather, and of course the bodies were much affected by it. It was rather horrid. I took his cab badge and some things out of his pocket. He was lying almost on his face, obviously killed outright. I stroked his hair and commended his soul to the Father, to the Son and the Holy Spirit, and prayed that we might meet again. I crawled away. I couldn't have buried him, and I couldn't have very well carried him. It was a ghastly place for a counterattack, uphill and open. They didn't stand a chance. I told the men, who were very sympathetic, that it was the soul that mattered. I feel very thankful. I should funk, but I claimed our Lord's help and guidance. It has been a real bit of experience. In that moment, I took the measure of death. I took his cap badge and some things. There was nothing more that I could do. On the 7th of August, he writes in his diary, then the next day, or perhaps a day or two afterwards, I don't remember, I went up in the middle of the day, certainly in full daylight when there, everything was quiet. I found that there was a sap reaching forward now out of the trench, and at the head of the sap, there was a little party of East Yorks. Gilbert's body was lying quite close to the end of the sap. Then or two or three men of the East Yorks, with amongst them Sar Sergeant Shepard, did then get the body in on a stretcher. I don't re really remember whether I went with them. I don't think I should have minded doing so but I think it was rather reluctant to see the body close by, which by then was much decomposed. Mm -hmm. I remember that I was able to point it out quite easily from the end of the sap. I don't remember any firing going on that day at all. On the right of, on the 9th of, 1st of August, there was still a good deal coming over. Why does he, well, he writes it in a certain way because there's been a few disputes in the family as well. A few people actually have claimed that they recovered the body um, and, and started spreading rumors, uh, and which, which really upset Neville and the family a lot. Um, some of them said, the, you know, there was firing going on. Some people were wounded as well during recovering the body. That certainly wasn't the case, Neville said. Um, so that Sergeant Shepard played a role in that, that, that we're not too sure of, let's say. Um, anyhow, we know the body was recovered. It was taken to Sanctuary Wood Cemetery. 
at the time there would have been at least two, maybe already three cemeteries in the vicinity of the wood. The site where Gilbert would have been buried, there would have been two. Um, uh, there would have been two cemeteries, certainly. You know, I'll skip these. This is, shows you the vicinity of Hoosh Crater later on in the war. Um, some famous photographs from the crater rim here later on in the war. Um, I'll just check my notes for you. So um, there's some interesting details about what happened to the grave later on. I'll, uh, I'll share with you in a minute. Um, we do know that Neville was there when he buried him. Neville also drew up the first register of the cemetery, of Sanctuary Wood Cemetery, recorded the names of those buried there, for instance, and he put up a cross. Sadly, because the area was located in the front line, several crosses had to be made. We do know that he had to be reburied perhaps once or twice. New soil had to be put on top of the body. See, I'm uh, taking longer than I was supposed to. I'll skip forward to Popperingham, the town just behind the lines, if you remember. Heaven on earth for the men. Gilbert went here to take his bath, if you remember. Now, the, ho the town offered any type of entertainment you can imagine uh, to the British Army at the time. And that caused some concerns with the, uh, with the people in charge of public health uh, in the army and certainly with senior officers as well. Now, um, Neville Talbot, senior uh, padre of the 6th Division, was instructed in November 1915 to open an alternative club. The first thing he did is he uh, recruited Tubby Clayton. I'll introduce you to Clubby and Tubby in a minute, who was uh, the padre who was actually going to run the club on a day-to-day -day basis. They met up at the local Kuvut family who owned this lovely building in the Hosthoestraat. The building had been hit, Kuvuts wanted out, and Tubby gladly paid them, you know, to leave. Uh, 150 francs a month, far too much, but while well, Tubby wasn't great on, on striking deals as long as the army paid them. Here you see Neville, the tall chap, and Tubby Clayton. This photograph was taken at the reopening of Talbot House in 1931. Interesting anecdote, they couldn't reach the top levers at the door, so um, Tubby had to bend down and uh, Neville had to get on top to, uh, to uh, open the door, fun detail. And that's how Talbot House was opened. Now, obviously, there was no, no intention at first to call it Talbot House. The name they had in mind was Church House. Being Padres, you know, they, you know the type. They were very persistent on, on spreading the word of God. And uh, Reginald May, Colonel Reginald May passed the queue of uh, the local division and he, he couldn't have it. He ordered them to change the name. And then the yes, thinking well, starts, you know, who do we want in this club? So we well, we want young people in this club. Uh, we want, uh, you know, we want young people to come in. Right, who do we know? Well, uh, who should we name it after if not the Lord? And Reginald May said, I don't care, name it after, your, after yourself. So Neville said, I cannot have it named after me. You know, who am I, senior chaplain? Come on. But can I name it after my brother in memory of Gilbert Talbot? And the reasoning behind it is not purely Gilbert, but Gilbert resembles uh, that uh, golden generation of young boys who never came back. So if you want young people in your club, well, let's name it after them in memory of all those youngsters who never came back. Gilbert was just 21 years old. So a good, you know, good idea to name it after him, I still believe today. So Talbot's house, I'm sure you know it, uh, thrived very soon after that. It was opened in early December 1915 the upper room with the chapel on top, the canteen downstairs with the, the piano, come by honestly, if you believe that. Um, the guards were frequent visitors, as you can see. Still today, we had the Grenadier guards a few weeks ago, a few months ago still. And from all that, Tokage grew. So Tokage was the charity we founded after the First World War. The problem that Tubby saw happening was that an awful lot of young men 
uh, didn't, uh, well, there was no mental health care. There was no help for heroes, no Invictus Games, no British Legion, well, as well established as it is today. So Tokage filled that gap partly. Um, so you can see the cross of Lorraine, the coat of arms of Ypres where all of them served, the flame of friendship. And Tubby, the rest of his life, dedicated together with Neville as well to the well-being of his boys, those soldiers. Tokage still runs today, Talbot House still open today. Not presently, but well, we know that. So on the photograph, we see Tubby with the Prince of Wales, remember? Childhood friend. So Prince of Wales would be the first patron, would be very much involved in Tokage. Connection they don't always like to play these days because we all know what the Prince of Wales, well, where he ended up in the end, this particular one. But the very, very big connections with the royal family still today, we know. Tubby is still mentioned at court today, we actually, we know. So here we go, Tokage. Several of the houses were aboard. Uh, I think this one uh, we were talking about with Gilbert, who's watching as well a few days ago. This one was the one donated by the Gross Venner family, the Duke of Westminster. Of, um, yeah. And Tubby came back. He organized these pilgrimages, these outings to um, the, 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 front, the former front line with widows, with veterans, with their children, with orphans. So he was, if you like, the first battlefield guide. I think he, well, I don't have a good timing. He would have had none, nor, nor did he have a sense of direction. So it must have been really interesting in those days. Here you see him talking at Time Called Cemetery. Interesting photo uh, for all of us to remember as guides. Look where they're sitting on. Often we have that debate, should you sit on the cross and where should you sit on it? So he clearly didn't have a problem with it at the time. Different days. And Sanctuary Wood, they often came to Sanctuary Wood. This is how the cemetery looks uh, today. That's 100 years ago, Sanctuary Wood. <coughs> and this is one of the crosses. Cross of Lorraine. Now, there's, I'm not certain if this is one and the same cross, but we seem to think so. The reason they have two beams is because the Cross of Lorraine, the same. If you look at the Tokage lamp, mm -hmm. it's the same. So a temporary cross being put up and we, someone was asking, I think Mary was asking, what does it read? We know that. Fear not, I am he that liveth. In lumini tua vidibinus lumen. In the light, in thy light, we shall see the light. So a lot of wording and being who he was, he was allowed a few extra letters perhaps. Um, so today, this is the grave. Born on its own amongst scattered graves. So you can see this is the origins of the cemetery. People were not buried in rows, but where they fell, if you like. Um, a few interesting things we found, not just me, but a few colleague researchers the last few days. So there you see it on the layout. Now, if you look at the first references of the burial place, Gilbert isn't buried on that spot. He's actually buried on the other side of the road. He should be buried roughly over here. So was his body moved or did they uh, perhaps get confused you know, with the map references? We don't know for sure. Something to figure out, although I think it's going to be a hard one to crack. Uh, so we now know he's over there. Another thing that's interesting is there's a wall behind the cross. If you look at where he's buried today, there's no wall in sight. So how is that possible? But again, we figured that out. Some of these interesting riddles. You see, this is what historians do in lockdown. This is the original cemetery. So this is where the wall would have been. Later on, the cemetery was extended. And even, I think it was in 1926, they still found one of the hidden cemeteries in the wood that had been obliterated. The bodies were two meters deep and they got them out and they added them to the cemetery as well. So that's why it was extended and the wall knocked down the entrance here today. Uh, lots of anecdotes as well. We recently found an eyewitness account of um, um, uh, a fellow padre who joined uh, Neville. Um, who joined, sorry, uh, Neville, yes, on the search for his brother in 1916. I'll see if I can get you the scan which was sent to me. 
One day I was asked by a British chaplain who was ordered south to accompany him on a trip he was making to his brother's grave at Hohu. He wished to mark the grave with a cross as the place was in full view of the German lines. We had to visit it before dawn. I met my friend at 2.30 a.m. in the large dugout underneath the ramparts at Ypres. We started off with two runners, but one managed most conveniently to lose us and return home. The other accompanied us all the way. It was a weird expedition. The night was partly cloudy and faint moonlight struggling through the mist which shrouded us. The runner went first and the padre, who was a tall man, obviously Neville Talbot, very tall, followed, carrying the cross on his shoulder. I brought up the rear. In the dim light, my friend looked like some uh, allegorical figure from Pilgrim's Progress. Occasionally we heard the hammering of the machine gun and we would lie down till the danger was past. We skirted the grim borders of Sanctuary Wood and made our way ho to Hohu. Then my friend got out his map to find, if possible, the place where he had buried his brother. He sat down in a large shell hole and turned his flashlight upon the paper. It was difficult to find the location because of the place had recently been a scene of hard struggle. The guide and I looked over the ground and we found a line of graves marked by broken crosses. The night was fast passing and in the gray of the eastern sky, the stars were going out one by one. At last, my friend found the spot he was looking for. And there he set up the cross and had a short memorial service for the dead. We know that actually, sadly, Gilbert uh, Neville Talbot has to rebury his brother at least twice um, because of the proximity of the front line. This is one of the grave markers. This particular one was put up, I think, in 1924 and found his way to Talbot's house. Disappeared again and came back again. Very interesting story. The last original grave marker that would have seen the war itself was in All Hallows when it got bombed in 1940. So we don't think that survives although we're still keeping, an, still keeping an eye out for it. So here you see Neville. An interesting story, if uh, the family doesn't mind me sharing, is that Neville would go on to be bishop as well. And um, his son would be named after him, Gilbert. Gilbert sadly would die, I think, in Normandy in the Second World War as well. So he lost two Gilberts. Um, and today we have uh, the son, I think, of Gilbert's sister joining us, who's also named Gilbert in memory. So the, land, the name lives on, not just in name, but also in politics, because Alex, um, uh, just check what, Gilbert, please interrupt me, but I'll just check, this is it, Cheltenham. The MP for Cheltenham is Alex Chalk, who's uh, related to Gilbert as well. So you can imagine uh, Gilbert would be quite proud, especially because he's a member of the Conservative Party as well. Not sure what Gilbert would say if he was Labour. Um, so, but uh, it's amazing to see how the traditions and the names live on today. And people still visit the grave today. You can see lots of the Tok H members going around, lots of photographs from the magazines. And Gilbert, well, stood as a symbol to many, many generations. Today you have his rose planted at his grave. And briefly, we're at the end. Uh, I'll take you through what be became of the area in general. This is Hoho. You can see a lunar landscape. The cemetery laid out at Hoho, where he fell. The first houses being put back up. The stables turned into a hotel. First battlefield tourists. The emergency buildings. This is, by the way, the new house of the Baron. Imagine, you know, he lived in a size and a palace the size, you know, 200 meters long. This was his new digs. The little chapel and school next door, which today have been turned into Hoosh Crater Museum, an excellent local privately owned museum we work a lot together with. So uh, I promise you a virtual beer, go and get it. <laughs> um, they do have a very good bar there. Um, the Castile in Toho, which is today a hotel, as I mentioned, with some relics you can see as well. And the old lake, well, today is a theme park. Interesting story as well, not meant to be disrespectful or anything. It was a means to get employment for the locals as well. So the theme park is one of the largest ones in Belgium. So this is Hoho Creator Cemetery. Uh, I'm going to grab myself a Wipers Times now, beer named after the newspaper. You can see it on the photograph as well, very local to this area here. So thank you very much for joining me. So this is the Hoosh Creator.
Um, thank you very much for joining me tonight. Uh, briefly, what's coming up the coming days, weeks at um, uh, Talbot House. So first of all, we have uh, George. On the photograph, you can see George Sutherland with Princess Alexandra. George is now 98 years old and he is going to walk for us from Listen to Military Cemetery to Talbot House, three kilometers. So that's quite a, quite a distance. Um, and um, uh, he's going to do that to raise awareness to people to support Talbot House, etc. So you can see some of his biography coming online tomorrow. Uh, do read it. It reads like a movie script. So um, his escape through Bologna, you know, it's, it's straight out of the Dunkirk movie. Um, you know, uh, his wedding was attended by General Montgomery, uh, an off chance. He actually managed to divert an entire column of 20 army trucks to go and see his girlfriend when he arrived back in Belgium. So um, interesting fellow and a very nice man. Some interviews of him coming up. And on VE, VE day, he's going to do the big walk. So he's very much looking forward to it, to get out of his house. Um, what else are we planning? We have a interview lined up with Jack Rickebosch, who was for 20 years um, warden, house guide, manager, if you like, of Talbot House. And he's got some amazing stories to tell. I've started editing today and it's just, well, uh, I get flashbacks from my youth. It is truly amazing. And I think tonight I can be bold and already get, let you have, because you've been so good at listening to me, I can already share something with you. And I know will interest Alan Chisel, for instance. Um, as well. Jack has announced his return, not full time, but as he's getting a little bit older, he's 65 this year, I think, he uh, would like to come on, well, on, on call as a guide in Talbot House again, take us round on stories through the house, just like in the old days. So uh, I think some of the wardens watching tonight as well, if Larry's still there, <laughs> if you haven't yeah. dropped off Larry, Jack's <laughs> back. So uh, I'm sure you'll be very happy to hear that. He'll be uh, doing his tours as he used to, only on four groups and only on call. But I do hope we can drag him in a bit more. And, uh, you know, we do get Ginevra in, you know, in the bargain as well. It's two for the price of one. <laughs> yeah. Good so thank you very much for, uh, for joining me tonight. Um, I, uh, I hope you, uh, you enjoyed the meeting. And... Um, you uh, learned a few new things. I'll just see there's some comments, see if there's any questions. Um, uh -huh. Thank you, Andy Wallace, Liverpool Scottish. That was my thought, yes. Thank you. Okay, no, but if you have any more questions, do give a shout, I would say, and otherwise, uh, cheers. <laughs> Hopefully you have a good one. The kids got an extra late night tonight. They've been very good. We've not been interrupted this time. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you, Hugh. Thank, Thank you. you, Simon. No. Thank you, Simon. Sorry it took so long. Uh, people who know me know why. Yeah. <laughs> Joe Bailey properly feels like she's on a march of the Phoenix with me now. That's running late again. Uh, no, Thanks very much. Thank no, you. no. I'm, uh, it's a real privilege to see you tonight. We're joined by some of the relatives of Gilbert. So I hope I, I did him some credit. Um, so uh, he's he was a remarkable you, you, man. You did brilliantly. Thank you, thank you, Gilbert. <laughs> um, Cheers, Neville Simon. Said, thank you. Um, and in life, in death, he achieved greater things that he could have done in life. So um, some of that is, you know, well, is true, perhaps. So um, Talbot House lives on, thanks to him. Talk Age lives on, and long may it continue. Thank you, mate. Well done. Yeah, yeah. Thank you and uh, have a good evening. Okay, cheers. Uh, Great. Thank you, Thank you. Good to see Bye, everyone. Uh, take care. Stay safe. Thank you. Bye. Bye, Bye, Bye Joe. Thank, Thank you. you. Cheers. Um, he's got his fear. Yeah. 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 Bye. Bye. Bring your English beer next time, Simon. Uh, <laughs> I do have some left here. <laughs> <laughs> Take Come care, on. Larry. Good to hear you, mate. <laughs> Cheers, Simon. Cheers, mate. Cheers. Hey. Thank you. <laughs> Take care. Hi, Mark. Thank you for uh, that was lovely. For Thank all the feedback. Mary. Hey, Mary. Hello. Just Hello. Thanks so hey. much for that. Really, you, you are going to get a big mention by Jack and Ginevra. Um, 
they uh, they remembered the horror movie you played Simon. in Ali Patch. <laughs> yeah, of course. Uh, yeah, yeah. Well, they would yeah. do. They would do. Um, lovely to hear you, Simon. Thanks for everything Very you've good. done. Thank and you. Um, hope to see you soon. God knows when it'll be. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. We hope so too. And uh, we'll have we'll have a letter waiting for you there. Oh, well, thank oh, you. Thank you. You'll lower much. yourself to that with your tourist tribe. We'll have a Any, anything. <laughs> <laughs> so, we'll have a compromise. We'll have we'll have one of Nick's Irish coffees, eh? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Simon, keep well. See you soon, Thank mate. You. Take care. Thank Bye, you. Bye. 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 Bye.